This is uh, Marty Wilson. It's uh, July 31st at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm sitting here in my office with my old chum, actually, Jim Sittig. That's another story for another tape. <laughs> but uh, we're here today to talk about uh, Sterling Strouser. And uh, in order to get started, Jim, I thought we'd talk a little bit about you. Now, I know you're an art. What, what exactly do you do? Well, presently I'm an art historian, art conservator, and art dealer. Uh, I've been involved with American paintings for 40 years. I started out as an art student with the Art Students League. Uh, I come from a family of art-oriented individuals. My oldest sister Mary was with the National Portrait Gallery. She was an art historian. My second oldest sister uh, was an art teacher at Kutztown. My brother John was a potter and I was a painter. And I started out um, Oh, at a very early age, buying things from my parents. I bought my first Colt pistol at the age of 11. No, wait, what, what, buying things from your parents? Yes, sir. Can you explain why you would buy things from your parents? Well, because I was the youngest of six kids. Uh, there was fierce competition in my uh, childhood. Uh, and I decided at a very early age, my father and I collected guns and coins together uh, when I was about seven years old. And so I decided at a very early age it would be easier for me to purchase things uh, from my parents because they were antique dealers. My father was oh, my right. father was a child prodigy along with my aunt and my grandfather. They were all professional musicians. My grandfather was the first professor of music at the University of Berlin. And when my, my family, the Civic Trio, were the first to transmit music transatlantically. Uh, they were the first to have platinum albums. Uh, they were world famous. The Queen of Denmark was my aunt's uh, sponsor and uh, she made my father change from a violin to a cello so my aunt could play the cello. Um, so uh, my father broke away from the family trio during the 20s and then went with Ernie Rappé and Walter Donrosch with the NBC Orchestra and then with the New York Philharmonic. Uh, he, in the late 30s, developed Dupontrange contraction with his hands, and at that time, chamber music was being taken over by big band music. So he decided to take a second career, and that was the antique business. So he's in, in New York then, right? He was in New York then. So how did he end up in Shawnee? What happened there? Well, the church in New Yola gave my grandfather property. They wanted him to be... My grandfather, when Johann Sebastian Bach retired, it was a city that took over uh, no for kidding. him. So the lineage of music goes way back. Wow. And my father always enjoyed paintings. And my father, um, unbeknownst to me, uh, his first wife was R Virginia Ray, who was a famous opera singer who stole all of my father's Delacroix paintings and uh. all the Rembrandt and Rubin and Raphael Peel paintings that he had plus everything else, and left my father with only some real estate. But he found my mother, and they developed a career all over again in, in antiques, and they found a place in Shawnee, which in about 1940 they moved into. So the art goes way, 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 way back, back in your years, family. Yeah. So your dad comes to Shawnee and begins a family. I assume you were born? I was born in Shawnee, yeah. All right. And then how... Did you get interested in art? I mean, other than the fact that it's in the family. Well, Why not music, I for was, example? Uh, well, I had a music teacher who had a ruler in her hand, and I <laughs> dreaded her. Uh, I was beaten and abused, oh, and uh, my father didn't want that of his kids because he had the same thing happen to him. My grandfather was a taskmaster, so my father decided that if... The kids didn't really want to get into the music that was fine with him because he had no childhood. He was giving concerts at the age of 12. So tell me, Marty, if you're giving a concert at the age, I, mean, I have concert posters in 1912 and 1913. He was born in 1899. So you, you know that you've been playing for at least six or eight years to be able to give a concert yeah. at the age of 12. So he didn't have a childhood. So consequently, I did everything my father never dreamed of doing. Uh, I had a very accelerated lifestyle growing up. I mean, I traveled extensively uh, when I was very young and was exposed to a lot of things that most people weren't exposed to. So you start collecting things with your dad. Your dad becomes an antique dealer. Mm -hmm. 
and at some point your interest turns to visual art mm -hmm. uh, as a painter well yes as a painter my sister encouraged me to paint my first teacher was Peter Cohen. I remember um, having um, Jimmy Wyckoff because he had just gotten his driver's license. Um, we took I took classes with Fred Beaver and, and Peter Cohen, but Peter Cohen was my first art teacher. And then uh, I started noticing Sterling's paintings were all down in our in our recreation area in our house in our den. Because your dad was a dealer of them, he or was a, he was a collector, a collector and a dealer. He. His first partner was Jack Chamberlain, who had an antique shop in, in Delaware Water Gap. And that Chamberlain is where Chamberlain had one of Sterling Strausser's paintings in his picture window that started Sterling's career in New York City. So this is my father. Sterling knew that my father uh, liked paintings, and so they would work together. And my father purchased from Sterling the uh, Thomas Birch F Fairmount Waterworks, which is in the Philadelphia Museum as we speak, along with Walt Kuhn's work, along with all these major, major, major painters. And Sterling would trade liquor, excuse me, he would, he, he would, you know, my father would give him whatever he wanted and they worked together. Let's flesh this out a little bit more. So your dad's a dealer in Shawnee. He has this partner in Delaware Water Gap. And mm -hmm. is there like a shop in Delaware Water There's Gap? There's a shop in Delaware Water And all, what happens? Your dad comes to the shop one day and here's this this picture by... They, they connected through Chamberlain. Um, um, it had to do with folk art because my parents were interested in folk art. And one of the stipulations was that the folk art had to be 100 years old to be an antique. So Sterling and my father and Jack Chamberlain and there were a number of other people involved uh, were finding these, uh, these paintings. I mean, great uh, paintings that are all in major museums as we speak. Wow. Roughly what year would you say? Is this before you were born, after you were oh, born? Oh, I was born in 54. Um, it would have been in the uh, late 30s, early 40s. I see. So Sterling for for my benefit, really, w would have been about what age at that point? Well, Sterling was born, oh, 1907. Okay. So he's still a young man. Oh, yes. All right. And he was very much interested in, in, in art. I mean, Sterling had it in his blood, um, just like everyone else that is involved with this. They have it in, in their blood. It's something they cannot not do, right? That's, That's what exactly I, right. Yeah. So your dad has this connection with Sterling, mm -hmm. even before you're born. He's known him for 20 years or yep, so, whatever, yep, yep. before you're born. Yep. What, what do you remember? When, what's the first time you saw Sterling? Well, I was exposed to his work. Uh, uh, for example, the painting of JFK sh the funeral in our rec room where, where all the kids played. I mean, I grew up with, his, with the JFK's funeral, which is now in the American Museum in Britain which I went over to Freshford Manor to check on not too long ago. No kidding. Uh, and then the, the other painting which I own in my collection is a portrait of my father, which perplexed me. Uh, I, you know, there were a number of other Strassers that perplexed me because I was academically oriented. Um, I went from graduating from high school, I went out west with the National Outdoor Leadership School and I was going to go into geology or, or, or you know, other, not an art field per se, but, had, and I just started uh, buying and these five and ten dollar paintings and I decided I loved buying and selling five dollar paintings and the five dollar paintings turned into fifty dollar paintings to dead or thug. So, and then I loved the painting so much that Sterling perplexed me. Uh, about 36 years ago, I, I, I started going to a lot of, I studied at Sotheby's, I studied at NYU, uh, I, was at, I took courses at Oxford University in England, I, I, I studied at Yale, and I, I was exposed to the finest paintings in, in the world, and every time I'd come home and look at Sterling's work, I got perplexed that here's a man in East Strasbourg who's painting like, you know, world figures. So I decided at an early age that I would start collecting Sterling's work and get to know him. And I used to bring my own paintings over. We'd meet on Stemple Street. And uh, I'd be 16 years old at the time. 
Um, and I pull up, borrow my parents' station wagon, and I put maybe 20 or 30 of my paintings in, in, in the car. And, and he'd meet me at Stone Street, and uh, he'd stand outside the car, and, and I would pull the paintings out of the car, and he'd say, leave that one, Jim. <laughs> leave that one. <laughs> well, no, Marty, it's not funny, because it was very discouraging. Because I might have 20 or 25 paintings, and by the time Sterling said, leave that one in the car, I might be lucky to have three out on the garage door for him to look at. No kidding. Which was devastating. Yeah. To me. yeah. And then he would argue about the use of gray, and he would, and I'd say, Sterling, I, I want to study painting, and he was insistent that I didn't. He did not want me to have any education re regarding it, uh, paintings, and I, I was perplexed because I'd been always educationally oriented, and I wanted to go to the art students' league. And no, 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 Jim, don't, you know, don't do this, don't do that. So I went against his will, and my parents were supportive of me going to New York to study at the Art Students League, which I ended up winning the Albert Handel Stewart Aquinas Award, and I was encouraged to stay there. So I ended up, you know, staying for five years in, in New York. So early 20s, uh, so you come back to the Poconos then, and you renew I, your... I came back in, in the Poconos in 77. And you, you had kept your relationship with Sterling? Oh, absolutely. Years. Well, this, the connection never stopped. My sister, when she was with the National Portrait Gallery, she had the Watts line. She was always in contact. And my sister, Mary, and my sister, Charlotte, always encouraged the art and the, the whole, that whole thing. And, and, uh, and my parents always, you know, encouraged me, too. Uh, although everyone thought at one point that I might have been going a little too far because there were times when I all I cared about was cat food or beer. Uh, you know, I wanted to feed my cats and I wanted to have beer. I didn't care about anything else other than the paintings. Hmm. So I went out and then during the uh, late 80s, early 90s, I started realizing the historical significance of this whole thing because at that time I had been handling major paintings, paintings that had... Historical significance of what exactly? Sterling. Sterling, okay. Sterling. How Sterling fits in historically into... Now other people that, now, for example, I don't care if this is heard in perpetuity because I was the only one... Ed Dreeby promised a lot of things for Sterling Strasser. And he used to trade Strausser fruit and vegetables for Ed Levy. Ed, Ed Dreeby. Dreeby, Dreeby, right, yeah. right, right. And there were a number of other people, except for Greg Carter. Greg Carter and I, we were fiercely competitive. Greg just gave the 140 mm -hmm. paintings. Mm -hmm. We were fierce, but we were respective of each other. And Gray looked at Sterling as a decorative end of it, and I didn't believe in it. I believed in the historical end of it. So, so consequently, we ended up with two different collections, although many of the paintings that are now in your permanent collection came from me via a number of other people. But I owned those but first. I was the first one to get those paintings. You own them, and then he ends up with them, and then he yeah. donates them back. Exactly. Gotcha. So well, uh, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, you, we, need to get, we need to talk about this historical versus decorative business that oh, you were just talking about. Very important. Very important. Yeah. So l let's just, just keep remember that we're going to talk about that, but keep going with your, your no, story. No, no, we can, the, the historical end comes from my... Now, my speciality is third quarter 19th and first quarter 20th. That 50 years of American art is, I feel, the synthesis of everything that's American. Um, because if you go back into the 17th and 18th century, we, except for the, the folk pieces, there wasn't anything that was truly American. You know, it really starts about 1890, 1880. We start our own institutions. We start to nurture our own soul in the art world. And in the 20s, it takes off. Uh, you start things explode in the 20s to the 40s. So consequently, I concentrated on Sterling's paintings from 1926 to 1946. That was my focus of Sterling. And then I eventually moved all the way through, but that was, the, that was my historical thing with Sterling. And then I realized that he needs to be seen and understood. So um, 
because other people promised him things, I decided I was going to pull through with it. So consequently, I got things that were not offered to uh, other people because I kept saying to Sterling, Sterling, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and he believed me. And, you know, he believed everybody, but he believed me when I said, Sterling, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, I'm going to open a gallery, I'm going to open a gallery with your work, and I'm going to get you in the books, I'm going to get you in a major museum, I mean, a Reading Museum is, you know, in Pennsylvania, you know, the William Penn Museum, there were a lot of people who couldn't see. They, they, the people, for some reason, they can't visualize. They, they have no conception of, of, of forward thinking. They're just, for whatever reason, they're lax. But I, I never felt that way. And as a matter of fact, when I opened my gallery with Sterling's work, Ed was furious at me. He, he was so livid that I did what I did, first of all, what I did, and that I had the paintings that I did that he felt that he should have had. Uh, I remember one time <clears throat> my mother and I were having brunch at the place across from the Deer Head. Oh, oh uh, Trails End. Trails End. And Ed was there with a bunch of people. My mother and I were there. And, and Ed walked over to my table. And he said, excuse me, Charlotte. Uh, I want to talk to your son. And, and no, they were all friends. And Ed proceeded to chew me up and down, and he, he, boy, he, he just, you know, laid into me like you couldn't believe. And uh, so after Ed left, I said to my mother, you know, Mom, I'm not hungry anymore. I just want to get drunk. And so <laughs> she, she said, I don't blame you, Jim. So my mother and I were like. She was, was she was she sitting there? Did she? Oh yeah, no, yeah. She listened to this. Oh whole yes, thing? oh yeah. He, you know, he was just up, so upset that that, that 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 I did something he should have done, but he did. And that is to get together, have a show. Now, Ed, Ed's intentions were good, but you know, Ed, when he came into Sterling's house to buy paintings, he had a roll of hundred dollar bills in his pocket, and he would reach into his pocket. He would drop the roll of hundred dollar bills on the floor for Sterling to pick up. Now he wouldn't pick it up. He'd have Sterling pick <laughs> it up. No. Marty, it's not funny. Okay. You know, and I like Ed and, and I can tell you another story about Ed. To give you a perspective. Now Ed was a very important man and, and he helped Sterling and he holds and the Dreeby family's a fine family. They did a lot for the community, you know, but Ed and I had problems. And he looked at me as an arrogant young man and I looked at him as a as a miserable old man that could have done more. Hmm. And so he'd have Sterling pick the money up, and of course Sterling would look at it, and then at that point Ed would say, well, let's see what we can do, and, and they would do it. But unbeknownst to Ed, Ed, Sterling was holding back things for somebody like me, and it, it all worked together. It all... And, and, and just let before... Let me clarify something. Ed Dreeby is buying paintings f for his personal collection, or is he a dealer? No, he had the um, he had the potato gallery at the Pocono Produce, and he had a lot of fine paintings. He sold paintings. I see. But so he's a primary, he's a he, collector, but he sold paintings too. He's upset with you because you're you're looking at uh, Strauss or from more of a scholarly point of view, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's looking at him as maybe a way to see. He, I like the looks of it. It's Maybe I can make some money selling it. Mm -hmm. But you've got this sense that uh, he's part of this historical... Oh, yeah, no question about it. Okay. As a matter of fact, when he came down to my gallery, he said, uh, Jim, he said, this is Ed Dreeby. I want to come down and talk to you. I said, wonderful, Ed. You know, I want to clean the slate. You know, I want to... Because I've known him all my life, and, and he is one of the most successful businessmen in Monroe County. And I'm a young man. I mean, I you know you don't you can only go so far. And so uh, Ed came down and he parked his brand new Mercedes in front of my building, of my building, and mm -hmm. and I greeted him. And he walked in and he and he looked he looked up at the uh, pointed ceiling and he looked around and he said, "Well, Jim, this would be fine for me." I said, "Excuse me, Ed." He said, "Yeah, no, no, no. This this, this building would be fine for what I want to do." And I said, well, what is it that you want to do, Ed? He says, well, Jim, he says, I want you to work for me, and I want you to sell all these copies that I'm working on. The, the, at that time, they were doing all these clay uh, pieces, 
uh, the Bixel Gallery was doing, and they were copying all these paintings. And I looked at it, I said, Ed, do you want my place to sell copies? I said, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. And it didn't happen. No way. Copies of Sterling stuff? No, copies of everything. other people's okay. paintings. Yeah. And I, you, know, my, I, I, you know, that might be fine for somebody, but it's not fine for me. I mean, it's original or nothing. So that was, you know... He wanted you to sell out to some degree, I guess. Well, whatever. He just, you know... And then when Stacy wanted to open that gallery, she she met with me. And my feeling was, you know, one of my competitors of New Hope was the man that she got together with to furnish all the paintings. She wanted me to work. To, and I always felt that the more galleries, the better. So I was always encouraged, you know, Stacy to... To do what she wanted to do. What's Stacy's last name? Stacy Lee. Stacy Lee. Harry Lee's daughter. Okay. Okay. Harry Lee's late daughter. Okay. She passed away. Okay. All right. So, versus decorative. So, I guess what you're suggesting is most other people are certainly dreamy and many other people. Oh well, Gray Carter. Yes, in a decorative format. That's why our collections were different. Um, I always looked at Sterling as, as a historical element uh, because, see, people don't realize that history is now. History, history is as we speak. History can be a thousand years ago. It could be a thousand hours ago. It could be yesterday. And it could be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So history is a very relevant thing. People don't realize the value of history and how it isn't until you realize the value of history until you start studying it. And I am a big fan of world history and also regional, because the regional history is the nature of this country's format, like it is with many other countries. But regional history is, Sterling would say something we are, we paint like we, we do because of where we are and, and what we do. So, you know, it's all, it all fits together. It all fits together. Interesting stuff. So here you are opening up a gallery, and uh, let's see, where can we go from here? Can you tell me a little bit more about the guy, Sterling Strausser? Sterling, I tell you, if you, if you, if you got him mad, he got mad. Sterling was a very, he was more intelligent than a lot of people gave him credit for. He knew more about art history than people gave him credit for. He'd take his paintings into New York, and if somebody didn't like it, he'd come home and he'd saw them up. He'd cut them right up. I used to find remnants of his paintings. I said, Sterling, what the hell's going on here? Why the hell did you cut this painting in half? He said, Jim, he didn't like it. And I'm thinking, what the hell? I know when I was painting, if I didn't like a painting, I'd throw the damn thing in the stream. You know, I mean, or put my foot through it. And Sterling, he would, he would just cut them up. But, you know, we would trade paintings and when I first started out I remember one time uh, I had a, um, a Carré which uh, is a New York uh, third quarter 19th century artist that I've been collecting and he's an impressionist a great painter and I showed Sterling this wonderful painting of these fierce clouds and he Sterling always had a saying when you went after a painting that he didn't quite want to get rid of or sell he would say the honeymoon's not over and it used to annoy the hell out of me because he would toy these things with you like like uh, like a like a string. He would he would get your reaction. You'd say, "Oh my God, string! I don't believe you did this." And and then, well, I've got to have it. He would say, "Well, champ, the honeymoon's not over." Well, one day, I got so fed up of listening to this, I brought in this carré. I just bought my first one. Oh, it was a forceful, atmospheric landscape. I mean, sweeping clouds, sweeping trees, wonderful, heavy paint, great painting. I still have it. And Sterling looked at this. Oh my God, Jim! He started stamping his foot on the ground. I have to have this. Have to have this painting. I said to him, Sterling, the honeymoon's not over. Boy, did he get pissed. Wouldn't talk to me for weeks. He was mad as hell. If he got him mad, he stayed mad. And I remember one time, years into the whole thing, Dot would look at me sideways. Now, if you, she looked at you sideways, you knew you were in trouble. You knew because she was a woman of few words, but boy, let me tell you, her words were like razor blades. Mm. And so one time I looked at her, I said, Dot, you think I'm crazy, don't you? And she looked at me, she said, why, because you collect Straussers? And I said, no, 
you know, she's... But Sterling was a very sophisticated man. He knew more than a lot of people ever gave him credit for. Without, uh, without the formal education. Without formal education. I mean, he had some education, but not a real polished formal education. Mm -hmm. His education was more intuitive. He, he learned from, he, he was a very intuitive man. Um, he, he did things differently. I mean, the boys in New York always put him down because they thought he was a naive country bumpkin from East Strasburg. They never understood his, his almost clairvoyancy with, with, with art. I mean, he could identify, he could, he could identify the feeling of, of work, which is, is a, a, cre a key principle in understanding. Because the emotion is is the motivation behind the work. You have to to get a complete picture. You have to pull all the nuances of of the work together. And Sterling could do that, without a doubt. How did he work? Did you ever very quickly? Did you watch him paint ever? Mm -hmm. Very quickly. Um, he he had two modes of operation. He had a lot of knockoffs. Uh, he would, he, it was mechanical, mechanical, but when he had something to say, for example, um, the grandparents, which is now in the university's collection, uh, those are history paintings. And when Sterling goes after the history paintings, um, Sterling's very deliberate, might take him a month or two to work on the painting. He's very articulate. He's very careful about not only how he's painting, but the paint that he's using. Oftentimes, he used to let the, his oil sit for a few days, and they had a, um, a different characteristic about him that he could model a little differently. He, the paint sat a little differently. And, um, he was very deliberate on his history paintings. And by the way, most of his history paintings that he would consider important, he would always sign Sterling Strasser. This, the ones that he signed at Strausser were pretty much ones that would roll right off of him. But mm -hmm. the ones that were, were signed Sterling Strausser were the ones that were, generally speaking, more deliberately done. He had a day job, right? He worked at... He was a gold metal typist, razor blades. Mm -hmm. And so one time I looked at her and I said, Dot, you think I'm crazy, don't you? And she looked at me. She said, why? Because you collect Straussers? And I said, no. You know, she's. But Sterling was a very sophisticated man. He knew more than a lot of people ever gave him credit for. Without uh, without the formal education. Without formal education. I mean, he had some education, but not a real polished formal education. Mm -hmm. His education was more intuitive. He he learned from. He he was a very intuitive man. Um, he he did things differently. I mean, the boys in New York always put him down because they thought he was a naive country bumpkin from East Strasburg. They never understood his, his almost clairvoyancy with, with, with art. I mean, he could identify, he could, he could identify the feeling of, of work, which is, is a, a, cre a key principle in understanding. Because the emotion is, is the motivation behind the work. You have to, to get a complete picture, you have to pull all the nuances of, of the work together, and Sterling could do that. Without a doubt. How did he work? Did you ever... Very quickly. Did you watch him paint ever? Mm -hmm. Very quickly. Um, he, he had two modes of operation. He had a lot of knockoffs. Uh, he would... He, it was mechanical. Mechanical. But when he had something to say, for example, um, the grandparents, which is now in the university's collection, uh, those are history paintings. And when Sterling goes after the history paintings, um, Sterling's very deliberate, might take him a month or two to work on the painting. He's very articulate, he's very careful about not only how he's painting, but the paint that he's using. Oftentimes he used to let the, his oil sit for a few days, and they had a a different characteristic about him, that he could model a little differently, that the paint sat a little differently. And, um, he was very deliberate on his history paintings. And by the way, most of his history paintings that he would consider important, he would always sign Sterling Strausser. The ones that he signed Strausser 
were pretty much ones that would roll right off of them. But mm -hmm. the ones that were, were assigned Sterling Strasser were the ones that were, generally speaking, more deliberately done. He had a day job, right? He worked at... He was a gold medal typist for the boiler works. He was a gold medal typist. He could type, I don't know how many words uh, per minute to give him that. Yeah, he was working up. He didn't, he didn't want to be a bohemian. He didn't, he'd seen so many other artists go off the deep end. Marty, he would just, and he didn't want, he wanted a wife, he wanted a, 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 a child, he wanted a nice home, he wanted uh, consistency above all, and uh, that's what he wanted. So what was his, do you have any idea, what was his day like? I mean, he must have gone, worked eight hours a day. Did he paint every night? Did he, he painted every night. He painted every weekend. He painted, uh, much to Jill, his daughter's dismay, he would forego a lot of things that most fathers would do for their children. Uh, she wanted him to go to parades and he would rather paint the parade uh, than participate in the parade. Uh, Sterling, uh, was a driven man, uh, absolutely. He also in his soul knew that he wanted to have his place in history like almost every important artist. They all want to have their place in history. They might not say it, but in the back of their mind they want to be placed somewhere where they'll be remembered. And that's history. You know, getting back to something you said earlier, and, I, and when I watched this thing I noticed that, uh, I got the sense that he was, um, you know, you talked about him coming back from New York and destroying his own paintings, which tells me that he took the word of other people more than he had self-confidence in his own work. But but, but I, what I wanted to say was, he, I got the sense that he was sort of a, um, he was a sensitive kind of a guy. He was, if he would, his feelings were easily hurt. I don't know how else to say it. Well, you'd be, you'd be correct. He had a very thin skin. Uh, he was exceedingly, I mean, he it was a gentle man, a very caring man, and you could hurt his feelings. Um, he wasn't naive in any way, shape, or form, but he was a gentle, caring, uh, very sensitive, and his sensitivity, you know, he was a very... Um, yeah. This must have been a struggle. I mean, because on the one hand, he's very conscious about what other people are saying about him, but he is, he was convinced, at least I got this from what you were saying earlier, that he had something to say, right? That he well, was an important... No question about that. He was an important painter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. But, you know, if you looked at the history books as we speak, he gets more credit for discovering other artists. He would put other people in front of him. I mean, Gatto is very important. Uh, for Sterling. Um, you should, re uh, I've given the, the university and your archives, I've given you everything with the video. I also gave you, which you should personally look at, is Sterling's document, his, his thing that he did on folk art, which will give you a much more in-depth on Sterling. Sterling was right on top of it. It's a great a, a great video. It was a wonderful thing that he did it on his own hmm. with Bert Hempfield. Yeah, I'll look for it. You have? Uh, you yeah, have, I'll, you I'll, have I'll definitely copy. check it out. Oh, you'll love it. It's great. But that shows you Sterling. And Sterling takes the bull by the horns and he just, he is just, he runs with it. I mean, he is, he, you know, like he does with my video. I mean, but right after that, he, his health starts to, to fail. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and and he he, yeah, and then the family shut at that point when when his health started failing, his family shut me down. They 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 said to me, you know, you have too many of his paintings. You have you you know, you're done. And and I thought, well, you know, I'm so I'm done. I'm still with Sterling, so I would still see Sterling every day or every other day, and walk him out to the porch, and it I didn't. I didn't need any more paintings. I would have loved to, uh, but the family, they all felt that, that I had too much and that I, you know, so I wasn't permitted the last year or two, uh, almost the last three years of his life, I was not permitted to buy any paintings from, 
from the estate or... So his health was failing over a course of three years. Yeah. And he had pancreatic cancer. It was terrible. He was in uh, horrible pain. It was... So he's retired from the boiler works well, at this point. Long, Is long he time. painting yeah. still during that? He's still that? painting. Yeah, I have a portrait of myself that he did just before he died. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was very... But he was a charming man, and it's great that he's here in East Strasburg. Uh, it's just, you know, I mean, he he's still with us. I mean, you look at his paintings, he's still here. Can you talk a little bit about how he, his contribution to the careers of others? Now, you mentioned some pretty significant people, right? That he, what, contributed to the development of their careers? Well, yeah, well, you know, when he was at the Boiler Works, he used to get the wood scraps off their crates and give it to Louise Nevelson. Uh, I have little messages that uh, uh, Nevelson would leave on his door saying, you know, Louise here, Strasser, where are you? You know, I'll be back. And I have letters from people like uh, uh, Glocken's son, you know, apologizing uh, that uh, he has to hand write his note because the cat's on the typewriter. You know, I mean, Sterling was uh, involved with Red Room, so all the big boys, all the big boys. His, the, his presentation on his folk art will tell you everything about that. It's all right. absolutely charming. But what about local people? I mean, did he run classes? Was he involved in... Well, you know, they say he, he was a high school principal. Uh, which might have been true, and it certainly wasn't a long line, wasn't a lengthy tenure in a one-room schoolhouse up in Mount Pocono. Um, did he teach? The party that contacted me when I decided I was going to sell everything after 1950 that I owned, um, they said that Sterling taught him how to paint. Um, and they wanted to start collecting his work, which I agreed to, to help them. Um, Sterling promoted more folk painters than he did any of the other academic He was in the hierarchy of the local art scene. He was, you know, in competition with a number of people, including Elnora Hauser and all the other, the 80 West group, and they looked at Sterling as being, you know, the father figure, so to speak, but they're all they're very competitive, and it still is a very competitive. You know, the arts are very competitive amongst other artists. Everybody's vying for that recognition. Everybody's vying for some recognition, if not all the recognition. You know what I mean? He was an approachable guy. People could very approachable. He would. He, you could. You could talk to him. Uh, you, you would see him and Dot at the flea markets. They tried to support anybody that had a sincere appreciation or, or made a sincere attempt. That was the key factor with Sterling supporting. It didn't matter what you did. You could, you could do just about anything, but as long as you were sincere about your motivation and and, and sincere about your determination and sincere about whatever you were trying to portray or whatever you were trying to do, he would encourage you. Absolutely. Very encouraging, man. Now, are you still painting? I mean, did he teach you how to paint, other than giving you critiques of your paintings? No, he, he tried to stress me in, 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 with the use of gray, which I did always keep in, in mind. And he never wanted me to take on anybody else's um, uh, theories. He always would insist on the personal evolution, the personal sight, the personal expression. Uh, oftentimes when you learn to paint, you learn theory, technique, uh, etc. And then you would paint according to those theories and those techniques. Sterling would, would tell you to throw all that out the window and just do what you wanted to do. That was his primary focus. Just do what you want to do. Don't mm -hmm. worry about what other people are doing. Just do what you want to do. Now, as speaking as an artist, can you just briefly talk about his, not his technique so much, but he was, what kinds of art he did exactly? I mean, 
Well, he did them all. I mean, uh, he didn't do much constructive pieces. Uh, I have the only woodblock print that he did. Um, uh, he only did two etchings. Mm, he, oil, he had all primary oil on masonite, on masonite. oil on canvas. Uh, the, the canvas are rare. Um, canvas are rare. The oils on canvases are very rare. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, oh, his are okay. Yeah, his are rare. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you'll find him in twenty six, oh. nineteen twenty eight. But after that, um, very rarely, uh, everything else is on masonite or, or, or uh, wood panel. And what was his house like when you walked in? Were there paintings Phil, everywhere? Did he Phil, Did he Phil, paint in the living room? Where did he, he paint? He painted anywhere he could paint. Dot didn't like the smell of the oil, so when you walked up the stairs, the first bedroom one on the right was his, his drawing room, which he had stacked, and he had his paintings separated with, with um, the clothes. Line, what do you call those? Clothes line. Uh, the clothes clips. Clothes clips. Whatever. Well, whatever they whatever call. Whatever they call. Uh, yeah, the whole. Clothes pins. Clothes pins. The whole room. When, when you walked into his living room, he had a couch with a wonderful uh, Justin McCarthy, uh, Washington crossing, the Delaware, which I think is in a major institution. Uh, in that one little living room, you had, you had. Dozens of different, very important artists, including Milton Avery and Elshemiuses. You now, I always wanted the Elshemiuses. I don't know how he got them, but he got them from Duncan Phillips and the Phillips Collection in Washington. This is the, the basis of the National Portrait Collection. And Duncan Phillips is a preeminent, preeminent collector. I mean, a man, there are a lot of collectors um, who, you know, have a, a different. But Duncan Phillips is a magnificent collector. I mean, he had these Elsheniuses, and I always wanted the Elsheniuses, but if you went to Sterling, and as a collector of Strasser, if you went to Sterling and tried to buy something else, you'd get shut down. You just didn't do that. Now, I had to let go of the Elsheniuses that I would have loved to have had in exchange for the Strausers, because if you if you approach Sterling and say, Sterling, I like your painting, but I like the Alchemias more, uh, you didn't get anything, and you didn't get anywhere, period. So that's, you had to stand, you had to focus, and and you had to, you know, I had a ledger of all the people who owned um, Sterling money, including myself. And, uh, for example, Gray Carter and I, uh, would have to give him X number of dollars a month. Now, we purchased these paintings, and then we would pay on time. We weren't allowed to buy any more paintings until we brought our balance down to a, per, a particular level, and then we were allowed to buy more paintings. But, you know, because Gray was a military man, very successful military man, and I was a starving artist, but, you know, I would do whatever I could to get the money to buy the paintings. So, we always paid on time, always. Besides you and Mr. Carter and Dreeby, of course. Oh, Dreeby, every, almost there, everybody. But were there a lot of these big collectors like you guys that you know? Yes, there were. So there are probably, how, how many paintings? I mean, this guy was very prolific, apparently. Very prolific. There was a, somebody, Andy Worthington, mentioned to me an astronomical figure of Strausser's that somebody thought might be true. and. I think there were 10,000 paintings over that mark, but I think it is possible that he could have painted the 10 to 20,000. How, mu how many might he paint in a week? Well, he could have painted three or four a day. Three or four a day? Wow. That, that's possible. That is possible. Now, on the ones that are very deliberate, for example, Jill on a tricycle or, or, or the letter, which was a very historic painting, uh, or the grandparents, he might have spent weeks, possibly months, with the composition and the whole layout. But he, it is very possible for him. I know that when he went to Atlantic City, he was in Asbury Park, and the first time he saw the ocean, uh, he went cuckoo. And he, went, he couldn't find any place to paint, so he went into the bathroom floor. And he, and he knocked three paintings off that are great. 
I, I can't remember what, what happened to them, but they're, they're out there. There are, I think, three or four or five. There, it, some, in one of these articles. One of, their, yeah, that, can, one of those is in here. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, he he just got overwhelmed visually, and he just lays that paint right on. But he doesn't. When I went down to Nashville uh, to, to meet Myron, uh, Myron was a very difficult man. And Lazan's a very big gallery. And uh, he mentioned something about having some paintings in his basement. And I was there on a buying run uh, in Nashville, and I had I was insistent that I meet uh, Myron because he was a very big dealer and a very big collector of sterling and a, a formidable adversary. And his me. last name is? Myron King. King, okay. So Myron said, oh, I've got some paintings down in the basement. So the furnace furnace room door was open and I think I might have said something as I walked by I saw a painting that reminded me of William Merritt Chase in the back of the burner behind the furnace and I said Myron who did that painting and he said oh, I asked a Strausser it was a big painting it was the road to Justin McCarthy's that I had and I said to Myron I said that's no Strausser he said that's a Strausser so I said may I look at it he said yes so I pulled it out and I looked at it and I said, I have to have this painting, Leonard. He said, well, the price is X number of dollars. I said, wait a second. I said, this is way out of line. I said, you know, you got to work with me on this. You know, I'm, I'm not leaving here without this painting. This is just the way it is. And he said to me, well, you're going to have to leave. And I said, I am not leaving without this painting. So he said, listen, I'm closing the shop up. I said, I'm sorry, you can close the shop up, but I'm not leaving without this goddamn painting. And he, and he wouldn't give me a, normally the dealers work with dealers. You, you, can, you, you might get a 10%. If you're lucky, you get 20%. Now, Sterling, if he liked you, would really cut you some slack and, and, and work with you. But some of these guys won't work with you. So I said to Myron, Myron, you're going to have to call the cops. You're going to have to do something because I'm not leaving without this goddamn painting, period. I said, take the frame. I don't want the frame. You know, the lower the price. He wouldn't, so I got so goddamn mad, I said, I'm buying a painting, and that's it. So, I mean, it was like 15 minutes or 20 minutes after closing time, and I said, I'm going home with this painting, period. So I paid him, took it home. And you paid him what you wanted to pay him? Uh, I paid him what he wanted Oh, you did, pay. okay. So I, you know, because I refused to leave without this goddamn painting. So I bring it home, I call Sterling, I said, Sterling, I'm back from Nashville. Oh, Jim, what did you find? I said, Jim, I found some delightful 19th century work, and I found a painting that you're going to get a kick out of. He said, well, bring it by, bring it by, because for years, for 20 years, I was his traveling museum. I traveled, I ran the coast. I would run from Maine, by in Maine, and I would run down uh, down south and sell in the south, by in, by in the south, sell in the north, by in the north, sell in the south, and I did that for 20, 25 years. I would run the whole coast. Uh, all the coast and I used to do all the major shows and that's what I did and so I brought the painting over and we were I said Sterling I'm gonna have to some of them are big I'm gonna have to meet you on Stemple Street so I met him on Stemple Street and I pull out these paintings and then I pull out the road to Justin McCarthy and he said holy hell he said who did that I said, it's a Strausser. He said, that's no Strausser. I said, God damn it, Sterling, it's a Strausser. He's selling, don't argue with me, Jim. It's not a Strausser. I said, God damn it, Sterling, it's signed Strausser. And he walked down, got on his knees, and looked at the signature. He said, I'll be goddamn. He said, it is one of my paintings. <laughs> then he said, I remember. He was driving up on Route 80, and the sky was just right. He said, Jim, he said, I pulled that car over, and I laid that, and it's a you know, 48, you know, 48 inch by, I mean, it's a big painting. He said, I just laid that paint right there and I laid it out. He did that big painting in one sitting. I bet you it took him 25 minutes. Okay. But what a painting. Drops the horizon line. Because of that horizon line, it took the total, and the mannerism struck me as, as Chase's work. And William Mayer Chase, and he's one of the big boys. I mean, the, the, in the hierarchy of American art, Chase is up there at the top. Mm -hmm. And I laughed and Sterling said, boy, he said, I remember painting that. I just threw that paint right on there and I just, and he does, literally. 
and he just works it. He works it. He works it. He works it. Wow. So how do you, how did you, how are prices set? I mean, you go into Sterling's house and he's got this painting and you want it. I mean, how, how do artists set prices on things like you that? You know, his the ones that were labeled in the back with an S or the dot or a D were meant for a dot. She had a handle on how the paintings were going to be dispersed. If they were on dot, you had to deal with dot. She was tough. So his painting, if it had a D on the back or a dot, meant she it could buy it through little, her. A little um, um, piece of um, tape, masking tape, and it had a letter D. If it had a letter D on it, oh, it was meant for dot. And I you see. had to go through dot. To get. The prices of the paintings at the time would go from 800 to $1,200, um, thereabouts. Now, that's, that's not cheap, I wouldn't think, at no. the time. Mm -mm. No, no, they, they weren't cheap. Mm -hmm. Did other people besides collectors, I mean, would oh, yeah, normal no. people oh, off the street oh, yeah, just walk in? A lot of, a lot of Strausers in East Strasburg and Strasburg, a lot of collections, a lot huh. of paintings, a lot of paintings. Of course, they love his florals because, you know, he's more known for his floral paintings. I mean, you know, with in the artist's ove, if, if you're atypical, they don't like it because if it shows something that is not normally recog easily recognized, people shy away from that, the, the, the socialize. He's big in Nashville. I mean, a lot of the country music stars, and I mean, he's big all the way down the coast into Florida. and and. But you know, when you see a Strauss, a big Strauss or floral, you know you've seen a big Strauss or floral. They're unique, hmm. you know. But that's that's his thing. I mean, you when you see certain Strausers, you can tell a Strausser a hundred yards away. Now, how, who decided if it got that D on the back, him or her? Her. Oh, she'd say, "Oh, that's a good one, Sterling. We're gonna, I'm gonna handle that one." For Sterling, you. I like that painting. Is what she would say. Okay. And you had to deal with Dot. Dot was a different person to deal with. She was tough as nails. Yeah. Tough. Huh. Very tough. She was a painter too, apparently, right? She was a. She did acrylics. She did watercolor. Her fame will be her hookings. Hookings. Yes. I've seen hookings that were illustrated in major journals that were listed as 19th century hookings that they couldn't decipher how she put her signature and then they attributed it to a 19th century artist which wasn't true at all they were Dorothy Strausser's work all oh, her hookings are, are fantastic huh. that's where she'll be known more for her hookings her watercolors are great um, but Sterling and Dot were competitors oh yeah did they meet because they were artists or did she become an artist because of his influence they were both interested in art I think they met at a play I think it's in one of the one of the documentations that they uh -huh. met at a play and Sterling just fell in love with her and hmm. that was the end of the story. Hmm. Interesting. So, and the daughter never went into art? No, she wasn't a big, big the, the, you know, no, the, she wasn't, wasn't terribly into it. All right, enough said about that. Well, what other things about Sterling do you think we should be talking about here? His gentleness his consideration, his support to any artist. That would be in his legacy here as being uh, an artist. He was a promoter of artists, of all artists. Didn't matter whether they were somebody like Bob Raisley who did this um, almost Bob's work, who's now, his paintings in California are being big money. You know, Bob was this, like a Salvador Dali, sort of. I mean, so you, you've, got, you've got people like Tom Fish who do this miminal work, and then you've got people who do, like Raisley, who do this intricate, almost like a photorealism sort of, but he would, he would cross the board. He, he, he wasn't pigeonholed into one particular school or man. That gave him, he was a diversified man. Intellectually, he was diversified. He was very literary. People didn't realize how well read he was. Not only just with art and art history, but in the literary world. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, and he, as I mentioned before, he was a poet that people didn't realize. So Sterling would help this career. 
anybody's career that was sincere about what they were doing. And he was a gentleman, you said. Yep, absolutely. That comes across in your video. By the way, this video was pretty interesting. I enjoyed it. Uh, what brought you to, to do that video? History. You wanted to get it down. History. History, absolutely. It was all historical. No question about it. When you asked him about it, did he resist? No, he didn't. He was fascinated. It gave him, uh, it gave me, gave him, gave me a chance to prove that I wanted to fulfill what I'd always promised. I'd always pr promised him a showing. I always promised him uh, all the things that we did. Uh, everything I promised, I did. And um, uh, yeah, he, he knew, they all know their sense of history. It's all historical. And then when we did this showing, he said to me, you know, Jim, nobody's going to show up. I said, Sterling, we've got good scotch, I've got lots of beer, we've got some great food, and if nobody shows up, that's their problem. Just as long as you and I can look at these paintings and enjoy them and have a good time. Well, I had a friend from Norway come in to direct traffic, and everybody thought it was his presentation, which was fine. And when I went out to see how Chris, I don't know what happened to all the cars because I was afraid the building was going to collapse. I mean, the floorboards boards were, were swaying. That's how many people. Now, you're talking about the public uh, first time you showed this. Yes, Marty. I tell you what. I don't know what happened to all the cars. I couldn't get any more people in the building. Wow. I don't know where. None of my neighbors complained. I mean, they had the park somewhere. And I went out. Uh, to see how Chris Wilson was doing with the, the traffic control. And, and Chris is my dear friend who married a wonderful Norwegian artist. And, and, and I was standing outside in the middle of the road, Chris, and I looked in through the open doors and I thought, holy sh 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 I hope the building doesn't fall down because that's how many people. I mean, I mean, we just, it was a phenomenal. And then I went over and we were talking in, uh, not too long after that. And I, we were very happy with how everything had worked out. And I noticed a couple drawings on the floor uh, that Sterling had kicked underneath his, his couch. And I'm always looking at things, so I pulled these drawings out. I said, Sterling, <clears throat> this looks like a preliminary drawing for one of your paintings. He said, oh, yes, and he did. He would do a preliminary drawing. And then, he, like Dot, he must have, because Dot, she would draw everything out and then transfer it on for her hooking. So if you bought a hooking from Dot, uh, which I did, uh, and I bought one in Nashville, and, and when I showed Dot the hooking, she said, oh, Jim, she said, I can tell you who bought that. And I said, well, she Dot, if you can tell me who bought that, can you tell me how you did it? And she said, oh, I have the original drawing. And so that, you know, the, the, the idea of having the drawings and transferring them onto the images, which Sterling also did, I didn't realize, so I said, Sterling, let's let's look more at these drawings because it shows the whole process. It shows how Sterling's thinking about approaching these compositions, and that's all educational. And, and I wanted an educationally, historically accurate portrayal of Sterling Strauss or Sterling Boyd Strauss. So I started pulling these drawings and said, oh, Jim, why do you want these? I said, Sterling, don't argue with me. Let's pull these drawings out. So. At first he would give me a few, and then he realized that this might be a, a monetary venture, so he started selling me. They were all affordable because, I mean, it was great for me, uh, you know, and it worked well with him. So after I acquired, I don't know how many drawings, I said, Sterling, people have to see these drawings. They have to understand how your thought process works and, the, you know, the whole the whole thing, the whole, just not one segment of, 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 of the approach, but the whole approach. So I said, let's put this together on, uh, an exhibition of drawings. And he thought, you know, what the hell, Jim, are you doing now? I said, trust me, Sterling, we'll do it, which we did. And I said, what we'll do, we'll do this in the premiere showing in conjunction. We had it up at your fine arts building. Mm -hmm. And I said, what we'll do is we'll have the premiere showing of the video and we'll have the exhibition of your drawings. Oh, jeez, Jim, you're going too far now. He's nobody's 
going to come. I said, Sterling, don't worry about it. The universe, we're going to have good food. We're going to have good, good liquor. Do you know, it was standing room only when that was premiered. Oh, yeah. And I was so upset with VIA sending this amateur photographer, a man that didn't know anything about filming. And I've been studying Sterling's for years now, and I know everything about him, or at least I thought I did. When he got up on the stage, he had a little piece of paper, and he started, I watched him, he started playing with this little piece of paper, and I thought, holy hell, he's playing with the audience. Now this is, I don't know how many people were there, I, how many seats are there? I don't know, you mean in the uh, well, performance the, room, yeah, yeah. There has to be up several the hundred, arts. I mean. Yeah, right. Between three and five. So he's hundred. like giving his talk to the he's audience? He's giving a talk, and he's playing with this little piece of paper. And he's playing with the audience. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He was playing, he's a natural, he was a natural, he was natural. Hmm. And he wasn't nervous, and he's playing with this little goddamn piece of paper. It drove me wild. And then I realized, I don't know this man. Here, I thought I knew him. I thought I knew everything about him, but I didn't. There was so much more to him than you could imagine. I, it was phenomenal, and I was so upset with VIA. And I, I said, listen, what happened to the film? Well, I, he botched it. I said, what happened to the raw film footage? We threw it out. And uh, you know, I was, I, if they were around, I would have, I'm not, I would have been arrested because I thought, what inept people would do something, a historical event, send some buffoon who didn't know what he was doing but it would have been wonderful it would have been it would have been would have been absolutely fantastic yeah. it was wonderful and and ESU did not send any students up to record it either apparently that's just yeah. you know that's hindsight yeah that's just the way things are that it's not the way things should be and it's not the way things could be in the future but it happened but it was a wonderful thing and he, you know, and at that same time, um, Ed Dreeby and Harry Lee uh, wanted to put together a tribute for Sterling at the Bixler Gallery, and uh, uh, which I thought was wonderful. So uh, I went in, and I was with Harry and, and Ed, and, and uh, there was a painting the year the potato harvest failed that uh, is in Beverly Tripp's collection. And I looked at this, it was like a melee. It was dot in the garden with a wooden rake in this barren garden, and she was painted full length like melee's work. And I mean, we're talking the 19th century master. And I looked at this painting and I thought, oh my God, I don't believe I see this painting. I don't believe I don't have it, but, but I don't believe I'm looking at it. I am left Strasbourg, went over to East Strasbourg, and Sterling, Sterling, we have to sit down and we have to talk. And uh, <clears throat> I went in and I said, I just came from the exhibition over at the Bixler Gallery. He said, what do you think? And I thought, oh, that's great, it's wonderful, but I am dumbfounded with the year the potato harvest failed. I am shocked at this painting. I mean, you could have knocked me over with a feather. He said, do you like it? I said, Sterling, I not only love it, I not only like it, I love it. I think it's, you know, it's fantastic. He said, well, he said, uh, he said, I'm sorry you don't have it. And I said, I, you know, that's beside the point. He said, and then he started talking about all the other paintings that he destroyed that he, because people didn't, couldn't understand that he just would saw them up. And then he would take fragments because there are a lot of fragments out there that were part of the major paintings that he cut up into quarters. And then if you find a, a Strasser with another painting on the back or a fragment of another painting, that's what happened. But absolutely ph phenomenal. Huh. You know, it's just wonderful. Did he, did he, you mentioned he used his wife as a model. Did he use his wife as a model a lot? Did he use models a lot? Um, Yes, he did, and he also used imaginary. All his forest of nudes, all, a lot of his nudes were imaginary. Uh, Dot was a very provincial woman. She wouldn't pose mm -hmm. for many of the 
the ones that are newts and yeah. are his. And he will say, you know, the only thing, you know, everything I've learned from women, I've learned from Dot. He, the, the, and this, Dot only knew Sterling, Sterling only knew Dot. Uh, Sterling was never a womanizer, he was never running around. Dot was his first girlfriend, I would suspect, and, and, and Sterling was for Dot's first boyfriend. So it's not like these days where you go through, you know, half a dozen marriages yeah. and, and you've been with hundreds of people, you know, it wasn't that way. You know, when you got married, you got married to that person and you live with that person for the rest of your life. Here's something that occurred to me while you were talking. You're saying that he's making, in a week's time, he could easily, according to uh, extrapolating from your figures, he could do 15 paintings at least a week. Oh, easily. So, and he's selling them for eight to $1,200? No. They're the only the important one. The only the important <coughs> Excuse me. Well, out of those, let's say he's doing fifteen a week. How many would be? For oh, even every other week, he'd was there sell one? them for uh, fifty dollars, seventy-five dollars, a hundred dollars. And they didn't have a D on them. Those, okay. yeah. I mean, he he would give a lot of paintings out. He would call them postage stamps. He would give you paint all the small paintings, the size of your uh, your recorder or a little larger. They would be what he would give people paintings. And Dot every every uh, Christmas would send paintings as Christmas cards. Oh, yeah, but did he? Okay, so that that answers part of the question. But th did he make a lot of money selling paintings? Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. Could he have retired as a um, typist? Yeah, I don't think he wanted to. Oh, no, I don't think he wanted to. I think he he liked his structure. He was comfortable with his environment. Uh, he painted. It, it, you know, he wasn't a big TV watcher. He didn't, you know, he wanted to express himself. So he would just paint. He'd just paint. Okay. So, yeah, he made money. Well, is there anything else we should be talking about? Anything else? Any other questions I should have asked you? Well, if you remember something that, that we should talk about, we can talk about it again. But yeah. uh, I just want to emphasize his intelligence, uh, his generosity, his intuitive ability, which is something you can't learn at school. They don't teach it, intuition. His love and his appreciation of art was his uncompromising um, stature with art. His his um, his vision, his support, his generosity, which I said before, which can't be over emphasized to mm -hmm. a lot of people who looked at Sterling as somebody to help him and he would he was unwavering with them and then a hell of a nice fellow sounds like you were inspired sounds like a lot of people was oh absolutely and you no know, no this is a man who used to walk his cats on on Anilomic street i mean well, i wanted to ask you, you you kept saying Stemple street Stemple street, Stemple street. Stemple, that's uh, just diagonally across that when you go up Anilomic he lived on Anilomic he lived on Anilomic if you were heading towards the university it would be the next street on the right hand side okay. Stanton Street and it was a little garage that he kept his car in oh I see and that's where we always gotcha. would met and put the car in. and I used to be, be able to whether they were my paintings or anybody else's paintings I would lean them against the garage door did he take many trips when he was painting I mean, he, I mean did he take trips intentionally like some artists go to Maine to paint he I think he was at the Jersey Shore. He, I don't know if he's ever been to New England. Hmm. Um, I don't know if he ever was. In, he didn't travel that much. He would go to he would go to Bloomsburg. He would go to uh, Weatherly to see Justin McCarthy, who was very important. This see. might not be a smart question, but where did he get the images? Where did the images come from that he put out on his? I mean, he didn't travel a lot. See what I'm saying? From his imagination. He had a vivid imagination. And if you have a, an imagination, you can conceptualize things. I know his forest and nudes were absolutely neat as the dickens, but they were all in his mind. You know, and they would be horizontal, they would be vertical, and they were all nudes. Uh, and then he would do all these little nudes. I mean, I mean, teeny weeny, I mean, teeny weeny nudes. Mm -hmm. that he would just do it the, with the end of his paintbrush, the point of his handle of his brush, he would incise into the paint. Hmm. 
He was an imaginative man. Well, maybe that's a good note to end on. Do you have anything else you want to say today? That was just wonderful. It was a privilege, you know, and, and I, I wouldn't have been able to have done it without the support of my parents, especially my mother, because I would bring the paintings to mine. I'd say, look what Sterling did, mother. You know, and Sterling would always say to me, Jim, I think you're going too far. I said, what do you mean? You're going overboard, Jim. You want to be on the ship. I said, no, Sterling, you can't, you know, you, uh, you know you, I have to dive into this. And I'm worried about you, Jim. He was always, well, what if you don't get your money back? What if you don't do this? And what if, well, Sterling, I'd say, what if, I can't live with what ifs. I have to have your paintings. And that's, you know, and, and that was the way it was for many, many, I got to do my cat portraits. I would, you know, it was just a pleasure to be around. I mean, for somebody who lived the life that I did, it was, it was just fantastic experience. How many paintings do you still have of his? I still have a few. Yeah. What's the most, what's the largest number of paintings you've owned by him, do you know? Oh, I hate the count that was up. Okay. All right. <laughs> Good All right. I'm money, I'm going to give you numbers like that. It's all right. Just well, a privilege. Quite a few. Great. Well, I'm going to